Hello, everyone. I'm Sierra. And I'm Ashley. And this is your Weekly Weekly Dose of Wicked. (laughs) On this day of podcastmas, my favorite podcasters gave to me 12 poisonings, 11 eyeball pluckings, 10 sleepless weekends, 9 missing hobos, 8 awkward dates, 7 medical malpractices, 6 southern stabbings, 5 golden rings. A quadruple homicide, a few cryptic notes, two teenage dirt bags, and a lunatic ex husband. Hello, y'all. What's crack a lacking? How's it going? Welcome to day two of Podcast Mess. Woo woo. Tis the season. To be jolly. Fa la 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 la. I was thinking it was the season for hot coffee and cuddly cozy blankets. Well, that too. But you can be jolly while you do that. Speaking of, maybe you don't want to join our Patreon page. Maybe instead you'd rather buy us a cup of coffee, which you can now do. If you go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash W-D-O-W, which is short for Weekly Dose of Wicked. I had no idea. Well, Weekly Dose of Wicked was too long, so I had to shorten it. You feel like buying us a coffee? I wouldn't. I wouldn't be mad. It is uh, 10 o'clock and we are both drinking cups of coffee right now. We sure are. 10 o'clock p.m., by the way. All right. So anyway, we hope you're all enjoying Podcast Miss and this lovely day two when we bring you on the second day of Podcast Miss, my favorite podcasters gave to me two teenage dirtbags. Was that good? That was beautiful. I loved that. Uh, I practiced. I'm sure you did. Probably all day. No, I didn't. Didn't at all. It was totally... On, the, on a whim. All right, so two teenage dirtbags. We're going to jump right into it because we're not messing around in podcast mess. We're going to start with Daniel Halseth. Daniel Halseth was born in 1976 in Estacada, Oregon. Uh, from a young age, it was apparent that Daniel was a special guy. He seemed to pick up on things effortlessly. He was very talented. He played the piano and the drums. Uh, that's how he got the nickname Drummer Dan, which would follow him through college. What a unique nickname, Drummer Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Daniel would go on to attend college at Western Oregon University, where he received a bachelor's degree in music. So Drummer Dan was doing things. He would then attend Corbin University, also in Oregon, where he received a master's in business. He's getting all kinds of degrees. Yeah, fancy guy. Um, it would be during his years in college that Daniel would meet Elizabeth Schwarak. Both Daniel and Elizabeth were beautiful people. They easily could have starred as the leading couple in, like, a young adult series, like, I don't know, Gossip Girl, One Tree Hill, you know, any of those. They they easily could have been the leading couple in any of those shows because uh, they were really just that beautiful. Yeah? Yeah. Super attractive. You're going to look them up? How do you spell his last name? Paul Seth. H-A-L-S-E-T-H. Exactly how it sounds. Well, that's not how I spelled it, so... <laughs> How do you spell it? <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here they are. Yes, they are like picture-perfect family goals. These are yeah. like pictures of them as they're older. But, yeah, they're like what you would see in a frame that you would buy at the store. Yes, exactly. They're beautiful people, beautiful family. So, yeah, not only are they extremely attractive people, but they also both had that effortlessness thing going for them. You know, like things just came to them with very little effort put forth. It seemed like everything came easily to them. That's the next thing I put. They were just a picture perfect couple. Daniel and Elizabeth would later marry in 2001. And by 2006, they had three children, Dana, Jordan, and Sierra. Uh, They also had relocated to Las Vegas, where Daniel worked in IT. He actually owned his own IT company. I don't know if I put this in here, but he actually started his own IT company. And most of his clients were in Las Vegas, which is why they moved there. But apparently it was a very lucrative business. Like he was doing very well for them. He looks like he looks like a what? Like an IT man. Like he's got that look about him. Yeah. So by 2010, Elizabeth was reaching for her own career goals. She had ambition and she wanted to be in politics. So what did she do? She ran for the state Senate seat in Nevada. That's impressive. It is impressive. It gets more impressive. You ready for this? Did she win? We'll find out in a moment. Okay. Daniel, being the loving husband and father that he was, supported Elizabeth's goals. Her running for a Senate seat put a lot on Daniel because she needed to campaign, which meant she had to be on the road a lot. 
And Daniel had to like not only continue to provide for his family financially, but then he also had to become the default parent because she was gone all the time. But he didn't have an issue doing this at all. He was happy for Elizabeth. He was her biggest cheerleader. He wanted to do whatever he could to make her dreams come true. So he did daddy duties during the day, took kids to the park, took them on hikes, you know, did all the things dads had to do. And then he would put them to bed at night. And that's when he would do his IT work. I love a supportive husband. Yes, he was a very supportive husband. Um, Daniel's sacrifice, well, Daniel's sacrifices and Elizabeth's determination paid off. Elizabeth Halseth, at 27 years old, would become the youngest woman in Nevada history to be elected to state legislature. What a bad bitch. Yeah. Well, we're going to hate her in a minute. Oh, okay. Well, at the moment, I like her. I do, too, but not for long. She's a boss, babe. For now, but we'll see what happens in uh, about two two sentences. She ran her campaign on honesty, high moral standards, and family values. Unfortunately, it would become apparent pretty early in her political career that she did not have those traits that she ran her campaign on. Daniel would discover in October of 2011 that Elizabeth had went away on an overnight trip with a former professional golfer and aspiring politician, Tiger Halgelian. Well, yeah, she's not the greatest. No. So prior to this occurrence, Daniel did notice that Elizabeth was spending time with Tiger and she was also texting him often. But she just, of course, claimed it was, you know, entirely professional. Daniel even went as far as to reach out to Tiger himself and to ask him, beg him to stop communicating with his wife. Wait, you said like the like a golfer like Tiger Woods? No, Tiger. Or a different Tiger. Tiger Helgelian. I, d- I was not aware there was multiple people named Tiger. Yes, there are. Not Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods is a golfer, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I'm not crazy. No, we're not talking about Tiger Woods here. We're talking about Tiger Helgelian. Okay, well, I thought maybe like that was his real name and he just went by Tiger Woods. I don't know. No, no. Tiger Helgelian, real person. Okay, sorry. So Daniel begged Tiger Helgelian to stop, you know, communicating with his wife. Um, That didn't happen. And so Elizabeth went away on this trip. And when she returned, Daniel confronted her about the affair. Mm. The conversation did end up getting heated, but there was not a physical altercation based off of both parties testimony on that. Um, And when Elizabeth said she had had enough of like Daniel's yelling. And I mean, he did, he did get mad. He did yell. There were probably some inappropriate words being used, but she, when she said, stop, he apparently walked away and completely dropped the conversation. Well, that's really big of him. Yes, I agree. I don't know that I would have done the same. I also agree with that. Over the next few days, Elizabeth and Daniel would attend marriage counseling at their church, which would make you believe they were working things out. But just five days after Elizabeth returned from her rendezvous with Tiger Helgelian, she went to the police and accused Daniel of open and gross lewdness. What does that mean? Funny you should ask, Ashley. Apparently, in the state of Nevada, when accused of open and gross lewdness, the law does not require that there's any evidence to make an arrest. They just arrest you based off of he said, she said. Okay, but what it, was she accusing him that he did? I'm getting there. It's my next line. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. So, essentially, open and gross lewdness is touching someone inappropriately against their will. Okay. So... It doesn't really say what she's saying he did, but she went to the police. She said he touched her inappropriately against her will. They arrested him immediately. Daniel's arrested. He's found guilty. He's sentenced to six months of probation. Wow. Anger management classes. And he also has to register as a sex offender. What? For touching his wife inappropriately against her will. That's pretty crazy. Based off of her really just statement. I mean, there's no evidence of it whatsoever. And also it took her five days to go report this. It's pretty insane. I agree. It's pretty crazy law. I agree. Uh, One of the sources that I looked or used for this was Mr. Balin on YouTube. He also thought it was pretty crazy. And he said that um, open and gross lewdness is like one of the most overused laws, I guess, of Nevada. Pretty crazy. After this, Daniel files for divorce and a bitter custody battle ensues. In February of 2012, Elizabeth is forced to resign from her Senate seat since, you know, she ran that whole campaign on high moral standards and family values, which she has none of since she had an affair and essentially tore her entire family apart. Understandable. So it's a pretty short-lived political career. She was elected in November of 2010 and then forced to resign in February of 2012. So not long. She was in office for what, 16 months? I mean, yeah, no, not good. Not good for her. Pretty sad, too, because when she was elected, apparently it was like a whole big thing. They all thought that she was going to be the next big 
political leader of Nevada. Big deal. I mean, yeah, she was the youngest woman. Like, yeah, pretty much. I mean, really, she blew her life up. Yeah, that really sucks. Sucks for her. Sucks for Daniel. I guess she has a good life now. I don't really know. But anyway, um, obviously, Daniel's a registered sex offender. So the court denies him custody of his three small children. Can't say I blame them for that, even though it's kind of bull squash. Yeah, it's a hard one there. Yeah, so Elizabeth's given full custody. And although Elizabeth has denied her affair with Tiger Helgelian all along, she almost immediately packs up and moves to Alaska with none other than Tiger Helgelian himself. I had no idea that would happen. Right, right, right. Yeah, um, and then the crazy thing is she actually marries him hmm. very shortly after that. And she's now uh, Elizabeth Helgelian. They're still married. So crazy that she wasn't having an affair, but whatever. It's so none of my business, though. <laughs> yeah. So this is a hard blow for Daniel. Elizabeth relocating to Alaska makes it very difficult for Daniel to see his kids. Uh, but over the years, he does his best of uh, visiting them as often as possible. Uh, he really throws himself into his work, just trying to keep his mind off of, you know, not having his children close by. He does eventually remarry, but unfortunately, that marriage ends as well. Daniel's having a rough time. He is having a rough time. But around the time that Daniel's marriage is falling apart, his second marriage, he's developed a pretty large social media presence. So I can't be certain of what his numbers were pre what happened to him. But currently, he's got like 12,000 followers on Twitter, like 5,000 followers on TikTok. Um, he's got like 21,000 likes on TikTok. He has like 5,000 followers on Facebook. Like he's got a pretty decent social media following. Yeah, not bad. Yeah. So he posts inspirational like messages, nature posts on, like I said, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook. He has a Facebook page as well as a Facebook profile. So he's got both of those going on. Um, he shares like old home videos of him with his three kids. His pages are honestly devastating to say the least, like knowing that he's no longer with us, that like this is his legacy that was left behind because they're extremely positive. His TikTok's full of videos where he starts with hi friends, continues to share breathtaking nature views or words of encouragement to his followers. His Twitter page is similar with inspirational quotes and photos of places that he's hiked. He really just seemed to have been like a truly happy person who wanted nothing more than to spread happiness wherever he went. Those are my favorite TikTokers. My biggest thing is all the time we hear them say, oh, he lit up a room and, you know, all of this stuff. And I always wonder if it's true. It was 100% true for Daniel because I spent hours on his TikTok and he was just a ball of sunshine. Yeah, you were telling about telling me about him. Yes. Without telling me what happened. It really devastated me. It's a really sad case. So even the even through all of this like positivity, during his second divorce, you can see in his videos during that time frame that although he's still posting positivity, it almost looks like the light's gone out in his eyes. You know what I mean? Like you can tell that he's being positive, but he's acting at that point. You, you can see he's having a hard time. Right. Luckily for Daniel, though, shortly after his second divorce, Elizabeth would decide to move back to Nevada, and he would once again be able to see his kids whenever he wanted. Well, that's good. It is good. So by 2020, Daniel's youngest daughter, Sierra, had moved in with him, even though Elizabeth still technically had legal custody of her. And while Elizabeth wasn't happy about this, it seemed Sierra, who was now 16, wanted to be with her dad. Elizabeth would take her home, and she would just go back to Daniel's. In August of 2020, Daniel decided to take Elizabeth to court for custody of Sierra. Uh, at this time, Sierra's the only minor child that they have left because the other two are over 18. And this becomes a huge, messy custody battle where Daniel and Elizabeth are essentially fighting over Sierra. Hmm, that's sad. It is. This battle goes on into 2021. Over the course of the custody hearings, Daniel would petition the court saying that Elizabeth was toxic and that Sierra needed therapy for her mental health issues that she was struggling with. He had taken it upon himself to put her in therapy. Uh, even He even brought letters that Sierra had written backing what he was claiming. Um, but Elizabeth would call Daniel a liar and say that he had forged the letters. So finally, the judge told them that the only people they were hurting was their children by continuing the way that they were. And so he ordered for Daniel to return Sierra to Elizabeth. But once again, she ran away and went back to Daniel's. So it didn't really seem to matter what the judge wanted, what the law wanted. Sierra wanted to be with Daniel. So in June of 2020, Sierra had began dating 18-year-old Aaron Guerrero. One thing that Elizabeth and Daniel did agree on 
is that Sierra and Aaron did not need to date and they did not approve of this relationship. And essentially they forbid Sierra from seeing him in December of 2020. Hmm. Not a good idea. No. To me though, I kind of wonder if maybe Aaron Guerrero was Sierra's motivation for moving in with Daniel. Like maybe she thought that he wouldn't be as strict on her given all of the time they spent apart. Maybe. It doesn't really say that, but that's just kind of how I felt because it doesn't really seem, I, I don't see any other reason why she'd really want to. And it kind of seems like that could play a part in why she wanted to be there. But that wasn't the case. So, because he didn't like him either. And this is where the uh, two teenage dirtbag case really begins is right here. So hold on to your seat. I'm holding it. All right. So it's April 8th of 2021. So four months after Sierra and Aaron are supposed to have been broken up. The first person to notice that something isn't right is Daniel's second wife. Her name is Bogdana. The two still have a shared bank account. I don't really know why, but whatever. They're divorced at this point? Yeah, they're divorced. Uh, I'm One article I read said they divorced in 2019. So that's where we're going to go with. So it seems that two and a half to three years later, they still had a shared bank account. I don't know that it was like their primary bank account, but they had a bank account that they shared. There was money in it. Hmm, okay. So... On April 8th of 2021, there are several hundred dollars withdrawn from this joint bank account. But the weird thing is, is that it's not like one withdrawal. It's many withdrawals from different locations all over Las Vegas. So it triggers the bank to hit the account for fraud. Right. And so they attempt to contact Daniel and they can't get a hold of Daniel. So then they attempt to contact Bogdana. So she knows that this isn't like Daniel and that he wouldn't, first of all, if he was going to take money out of the account, he would have just taken out one lump sum. And also he doesn't normally use that account. Right. So that was weird. Yeah. It's just weird to her. So she tries to contact him, but she also has no luck. Uneasy about this, Bogdana contacts Christine Halseth, which is Daniel's mother. So her ex-mother-in-law. She knows that Christine Halseth, Daniel's mother, and Daniel talk nearly every single day. So if she can't get a hold of Daniel, then she thinks Christine most likely can. Makes sense. Yeah. So Daniel's mother ends up trying to contact um, Daniel. She can't get in touch with him. So she attempts to contact Sierra. Uh, Sierra does not answer her grandmother's phone calls, but she does text her grandma and say that Daniel's fine, but his phone's broken. It'll be fixed by tomorrow morning. Okay. Kind of weird. First of all, to start off with, he's fine, but his phone's broken. She didn't ask how he was. She just wanted to talk to him. But whatever. Right, but maybe the grandma, like, had a tendency to, like, freak out. Like, if that was me texting Jacob, I would expect him to say that you were okay. Because, obviously, I would not think you were okay, and that's why I was contacting him. Possibly, but I don't know. I I just thought it was a little weird myself. But, yeah, maybe. So, the next morning, by 10 a.m. on April 9th, Daniel's mother, Christine, still has not been able to get in in contact with Daniel. So she tries contacting Sierra again. Um, But again, Sierra will not answer her phone calls. But she texts her again. Yeah, um, Grandma ain't messing around. She texts Sierra and she demands to hear from Daniel. Sierra texts back and says, oh, he's in the shower, but I'll have him call you. Peggy wants to talk to him first. Just to clarify, Peggy is Peggy's his landlord. Okay. Not really sure why his landlord takes priority over his mother, but she says he's got to call Peggy before he can call you. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of weird. So Christine texts Sierra and threatens to call the police. And Sierra does not respond to that. I'm not sure why Grandma didn't just go ahead and call the police at this point after she threatened it. But she doesn't. She calls Daniel's landlord, Peggy Newman. Around the time that Grandma's calling Peggy, though, uh, Altima matching Daniel's. I put a gray Altima, but I don't know if it was gray or blue. Regardless, it was a Nissan Altima. Matching Daniel's car is caught on surveillance footage leaving the area at about 1020. So about 20 minutes after talking to Grandma. Um, Peggy Newman tells Christine Halseth, Daniel's mother, she will go by the house to check on Daniel, uh, but she won't be able to do it for a few hours. So I think at this point, Christine doesn't really know what to think because at this point she hasn't talked to Daniel, but she also hasn't talked to Sierra. Like everything she's done is via text message. So it kind of seemed like at this point she was worried about both of them. Right. But she tells Peggy that's fine just to go by whenever she can. At some point during the day, though, Christine does end up losing her patience because at 1.46 p.m., she calls the police and she asks them to do a welfare check. 
Before the police arrive, though, Peggy does actually stop by the house. She's afraid to enter the home alone, and she waits in the driveway for a friend. Her friend gets there, and they enter the house, uh, which was left unlocked, and they're immediately hit with the smell of smoke. They search the whole house for Daniel, and they find no signs of him there. Uh, but they notice that his car's gone. So they're like, oh, maybe it's in the garage. Like, let's see. So they go in the garage, and that is where they find Daniel Halseth's charred remains. It's in the garage. His body has been shoved inside of a sleeping bag and lit on fire. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So Peggy immediately calls the police, and an investigation ensues, obviously. Uh, Sierra is nowhere to be found at this point. And I don't know if that's what made her a suspect initially, but if it didn't, the fact that uh, Daniel's card had been used all over Las Vegas left a pretty little trail for the police to follow. So not the smartest cookie? No, for sure. Uh, So 24 hours prior... On the morning of April 8th, surveillance footage catches a male and a female using Daniel's bank card at multiple ATMs, which is what triggered the fraud alerts to Bogdana. I don't understand why the card wasn't shut off at that point, though, like if they thought it was fraud, but they still use the card. Um, His card is then used at a Winco, which is a Las Vegas grocery store. Once again, surveillance footage shows the same male and female. Uh, His card is then used at a Las Vegas Home Depot, where surveillance catches that same male and female once again. And then finally, the same... Two are caught driving back in Daniel's car to the residence. Uh, and the following morning around 1020, the same male and female are then spotted, leaving once again in Daniel's Ultima. Yeah, my bank account would have shut my card off after the first one. Right. That's what I thought, but it didn't. And as if the electric, like electronic paper trail wasn't enough, they actually found receipts in the home for Home Depot, Winko, and the ATMs. So they didn't really have to look too far. Everything was in the house. It appeared as though someone had tried to clean up the murder scene with bleach, and the receipts showed bleach had been bought, as well as tarps, um, other cleaning supplies, and that at Home Depot, they had actually bought power tools, specifically a circular saw and a chainsaw. So they bought all of this on his credit card, or debit card, or whatever it was? Yep. It's really shitty. I agree. I agree 100%. Um, Like, not only are they going to kill him, but they're going to use his money to buy all the supplies to do it. So, I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but uh, he's already dead when they're using his card. Oh. They've already killed him. I mean, that doesn't make it any better, but... No, but that's my professional opinion, I guess. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, So, in case you haven't put it together yet, the male and female that are caught on surveillance using Daniel's card all over Las Vegas willy-nilly and then driving around in his car are 16-year-old Sierra Halseth and 18-year-old Aaron Guerrero. Whoa. Shocker. Yeah. Daniel has been stabbed over 70 times. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. And prior to lighting his body on fire, it appears as though they attempted to dismember his body with the power tools that they bought. Ugh. That's awful. Mm-hmm. When they were not able to dismember his body, they attempted to burn the house down, but the fire that they set wasn't big enough, and it essentially just extinguished itself. They left pocket knives in the sink, which is the suspected murder weapon. They stabbed him 70 times with pocket knives? Yes. Pocket knives. 70 times with pocket knives. Yeah. Real, I mean, teenage dirtbags. Yeah, I'm just thinking, like, how small, like, pocket knives are. I mean, I'm thinking it was more so like one of Jacob's pocket knives. Like a big one. You know what I mean? Not like okay, a... But still. It's still, but yeah. I mean, I'm just saying that I, not like a little tiny pocket knife. I would say like a one like he carries. Like a six inch blade, probably. Right. I mean, I guess that's not much different than like a kitchen knife, but it just seems a lot worse. Mm-hmm. And if they were old pocket knives, they were probably dull. They stabbed him 70 times. I'm going to go with they were probably either new or sharpened. <sighs> yeah. Or there was a lot of rage behind those dull knife stabbings. Possible. So the two are picked up in Salt Lake City, Utah on April 13th. And when they are arrested, obviously they took their belongings. And on Sierra Halsa's phone, there's a video of her and Aaron Guerrero. I'm going to link the video in the show notes, but I'm just going to tell you what it says real quick just to go through it instead of like making you watch it and all that jazz. If you want to watch it, you can later, but it's disgusting. So I don't really feel like you should want to watch it. Probably not. So the two are laying in a tent. And the video starts off with Sierra giggling and covering her mouth. And she says, I don't know what to say. And then Aaron says, welcome back to our YouTube channel, Sierra. Day three, Aaron. Day three after murdering somebody. Whoa, don't put that on camera. Aaron then hugs her face, kisses her on the forehead and says, it was worth it. Sierra, we had sex a lot today. Aaron laughing. That was the payment for doing it. Uh, There's more dialogue that I don't really think is pertinent. 
But then Aaron, he's like hugging her and he starts slapping her in the face. It's like he's trying to be playful, but it's much harder than I'm comfortable with as far as like a playful slap. And he does it repetitively. And then he puts his hand around her neck and starts to choke her to a point where she actually is gagging and starts to cough. And they put this video on YouTube? No, it was on her phone. Oh, okay. But they said it was YouTube, but it wasn't really YouTube. Yes. Yes. Okay. No. No, they said it was YouTube, but no, it was on her phone. Um, so I found Daniel's obituary. And this his obituary says that he died on April 9th. It also mentions that he is survived by his two loving children, Dana and Jordan, which I found interesting. I mean, obviously, I don't know that I would want them to mention my child that killed me in my obituary either, but I thought it was kind of crazy that they completely left her out of it, especially considering it was probably written days after. Like, did they even know she had done it at that point? I don't know. I mean, they must have, or they would have put her in there. Yeah, I mean, they must have to have left her out, but I thought that was kind of interesting and even though the obituary says april 9th i mean he had to have died on april 8th and this is where my detective work comes into play because (laughs) let's hear it okay so aaron guerrero apparently ran away from home early april 8th like i said daniel is heavily involved in social media he posts on his facebook page three to six times a day just on facebook his last post was April 7th at 10 13 p.m when he posted good night friends with a picture of a las vegas billboard that read, do you believe in God? He believes in you. So I don't think that he would have went all of April 8th without posting if he was alive. Right. And also, they went and picked up all those supplies on April 8th. So that's what I'm saying. To me, they had to have killed him with the pocket knives and then went out shopping for supplies. Right. I just don't see how he would have went about his day and not posted on any of his social media. Right. Yeah, you would think he would. So, like I said, I spent hours going through Daniel's social media accounts. I think that's why this case is really hard for me. um, Because he just had such a big presence. And it's recent. And I feel like you know him. Yeah. I mean, kind of. So, on April 3rd, just four days before Sierra murdered her father, Daniel posted a video of Sierra as a young girl. A few days before that, he posted videos of him dancing with Sierra and Dana as he prepared to take them to a father-daughter dance. Again, these were old videos that he had shared But it's almost like the social media presence that he has invites you into their lives. So, yeah, it's like you know them. Right. That's how most influencers are. Like, that's how they get so many people. Yeah. So, also on April 3rd, he posted, I think it's important to realize that no matter how good you are to people, it won't make them good to you, which I find heartbreaking. On April 21st, he posted pictures of Sierra captioned, I love you so much, daughter. You are so strong and brave. I love you. We've got this. So, it just seems like Daniel really loved his children. And he had no idea it was coming. No, to be betrayed by one is just heartbreaking. Another thing is, he had to have literally had no idea it was coming. He had to have trusted his daughter because he's a fit guy. Right. Like, it had to have just come completely out of the blue for him to be attacked by Sierra and Aaron. Did they ever, like, come forward and say, like, how they did it? No. Uh, both Sierra Halseth and Aaron Guerrero pled guilty to Dano's murder. They were both sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 22 years. Um, so, no, I mean, it didn't really I don't, I don't know that there's really going to be much on like their them talking about it because they both pled guilty. Right. So essentially, I mean, the investigation's over and they pled guilty. So the trial's over. The other thing that is so crazy to me which I found after I wrote this, so I just added it at the end. Um, The reason why they didn't want Aaron and Sierra together is because Sierra's parents had found out that the two planned to run away and move to Las Vegas. Not to Las Vegas. They live in Las Vegas. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, wait a minute. (laughs) No, I'm sorry. They planned to run away and move to L.A. Okay, that makes sense. Not Las Vegas, L.A., Los (laughs) Angeles. Um. Obviously, they didn't approve of that since Sierra was 16. Right. Wait a couple of years, girl. Right. So Daniel and Elizabeth went to Aaron's parents. And all of the parents decided unanimously that it was best that they not see each other. Right. So it wasn't just... I don't understand why Daniel was their victim of choice. Like, it, all of the parents felt the same way. Why did they kill Daniel? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Like, was there nothing of, like, why they did what they did or how they did what they did? I don't know. Because, like, I mean, obviously, I haven't spent hours looking at his TikTok. But, like, I mean, I saw, like, a couple that you showed me the other day. And I saw 
pictures of him. Like, yeah, he's a pretty, like, fit dude. Like, and his little 16-year-old daughter wouldn't have been able to take him. No, for sure. I mean, they definitely both had to have taken him. But honestly, I, I feel like even if, I mean, I don't know. I feel like even if he were, like, attacked by both of them, I feel like he's fit enough that he probably could have taken them both. You know what right, I mean? Right, I agree. That's what I'm saying, like. He had to have. He had to have just been completely caught off guard. I mean, yeah. I don't know because it didn't discuss anything. Like I was thinking, Aaron ran away from home on April eighth. So I was thinking, oh well, maybe they like got him while he was sleeping because it was early morning. But there was nothing released about his bed being bloodied because I mean that would make sense if he ran away in the middle of the night. They said early on April eighth, so we're talking like two a.m. Comes into the house and they attack him in his bed when he's sleeping. Okay, that yeah, makes that sense. Makes sense. It didn't give you any of that though, so. It also didn't give you, like, a time of death, right? No. So, I mean, that's possible. His obituary says he died on April 9th, but I don't I don't see that that's accurate. I don't yeah, know. Definitely teenage dirtbags. Definitely turn age. Definitely turn age. Definitely teenage dirtbags. <laughs> um, last thing I want to leave you with is, um, since you had said, like, they weren't very smart. So, the reason why they actually got caught is because they got on a bus without buying a ticket. And when they came around checking the tickets, they didn't have one. So they took their names, put them in the system, and saw that they were wanted in Las Vegas. But, like, how stupid are you? You got on a bus. Like, that's so stupid. Right. Buy a ticket. Right! Didn't they take money out of Daniel's accounts? It only been a couple days by now. Right. There's no way they could have spent it all. I mean, I guess they could have if they were just luxuriously living life. But I don't know, because they were sleeping in a tent in Salt Lake City. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, they were on the run, so. I don't know. I guess they could have been out buying, like, steak and lobster dinners. I don't know. All in all, though, awful case. Was not a fan. Um, One of my biggest, like, fears in life is that one of my children will grow up and kill me. So I don't really like to cover that. <laughs> it does. I hate it. Like, I hate when, par- like, kids turn around and kill their parents. How dare you? Yeah. I just don't understand it. I mean, I don't understand how most people kill anyone, but... Kill your parents. He loved her. He gave, I mean... It doesn't seem like he did anything wrong. No, it doesn't seem like he wasn't abusive. Like, I don't know. Not a fan. So anyway, there it is. Second day of podcast, miss. We'll see you tomorrow for day three when we cover a couple of cryptic notes. No, a few cryptic notes. Well, technically, I think it's a couple. It's only two, so. Okay, shh. We changed it to a fit the song. We'll see you tomorrow for a few cryptic notes. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. If you liked what you heard and want to support a small podcast, please give us money at www.patreon.com forward slash weekly dose of wicked, where you can join one of our three tiers at the $5 level. We've got the moderately wicked for $7 a month. We've got the awesomely wicked. And for all of those high rollers, big ballers out there, we got the $10 level, the extraordinarily wicked. As a member of our Patreon, you are entitled to bonus episodes. Uh, you also get a one-time shout out on our podcast, as well as some other cool little extra things going on there. So come on over, join our fan club. Feel free to give us a follow on Instagram at weekly underscore dose underscore of underscore wicked or you can literally just search weekly dose of wicked and we'll pop up because we're the only ones for a direct feed of our podcast please go to www.weeklydoseofwicked.buzzsprout.com great news you can now listen to us pretty much wherever you like to listen to podcasts that's right folks we are big time you can now hear your weekly dose of wicked on apple Podcasts, spotify google podcast amazon music stitcher iheart radio tune in plus alexa podcast addict pod chaser pocket cast deezer listen notes player fm podcast index overcast castro cast box and pod friend the only place we can't seem to get ourselves on is pandora so we'll let you know when that happens In the meantime, make sure to come back next Wednesday for your weekly Weekly dose dose of of wicked. Wicked. But um, I'm.